Welcome back. This is the video lecture associated with Chapter 5, Part 2. Now last time we talked about the big myth that communication is not easy. We explored communication models from interpersonal to mass communication models so that we could understand the various elements that add to the difficulty of communicating effectively. And finally, we looked at the evolution of mass communication theory. Now in today's video lecture, we're going to think about psychology theory and communication theory, particularly motivations and perceptions. And I'm going to cover several different ideas under motivations and perceptions. Then we're going to explore public opinion, how it's measured, how it might be used. And finally, we're going to use a case study from the Beach Art Museum on the Kansas State University campus to sort of pull our ideas together. So let's get going with motivations and perceptions. Ideas I want to go over, have, uh, or some are from the ancient Greeks, ethos, logos, pathos. You're going to learn about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We're going to explore are people rational or irrational, and we're going to learn about priming and framing and how this impacts persuasion, and we're the three P's and Freud versus Rogers. And finally, I'm going to give you a nice tool called Monroe's Motivated Sequence that can help you design persuasive messages that are more effective. So let's get going with those ideas of ethos, logos, and pathos. Ethos, and these ideas, you know, they've been around a long time. Maybe you've heard them in a speech class or in an English writing class. It was the ancient Greeks and Romans who first started studying rhetoric and how to be persuasive. And they came up with these great basic concepts of ethos, logos, and pathos. And what they said, ethos, when you're trying to persuade somebody, ethos is the appeal or the proof, if you will, based on the character of the speaker. So this is the idea that depending on who says it, you know, can increase or decrease the weight of any given message. Logos is a different kind of appeal or proof. These are the kinds of appeals or proof that are based on logic and reasoning. I'll give you good reasons and then, you know, maybe you'll accept a persuasive message. And finally, is pathos. And pathos is sort of like the emotional appeal. It's the appeal or the proof that's based on emotion. And we can see lots of communication campaigns that specifically use these concepts of ethos, logos, and pathos. So I pulled several examples associated with breast cancer to show how this works. This is Facebook, okay? And there's a movement on Facebook called Protect Your Mom. If you remember our two-step flow theory, what this is saying is asking young women to encourage their mothers to do some protective and proactive breast health things such as self-exams and mammograms. But this is ethos. The reason a woman would listen to this is because her daughter is telling her, I think this is important. And so this Facebook group is trying to encourage daughters to get their mothers to engage in proactive breast health activities. So that's an example of ethos. So here we have a breast cancer, exam a breast cancer campaign example where the character of the speaker is very important. Here's another example of ethos used in a health campaign. And this is in Tehran. And it says, in a small room in Tehran, 12 women of all ages are gathered around a long table, listening intently and taking notes while their health trainer talks animatedly about the thyroid. The women will leave class today and knock on as many as 50 doors to tell families under their care about the necessary the necessity of using iodized salt to prevent the development of problems in children, especially important lessons in these poor parts where seafood is rarely eaten. Okay, here in the United States, if you buy salt, you have to hunt to find uniodized salt. Okay, iodine is, is put in most salt products in the United States. And here we don't have problems associated with uh, thyroid development anymore because we have better nutrition. But there's many parts of the world where it's very important that families overtly put iodine into their diets to avoid these kinds of problems. So this is in Tehran. Would it work if you had a white Western doctor marching in and telling women in Tehran how to feed their families? Well, no, I don't think so because that speaker would have no character. But by having women talk to women, there you're getting some effect. So the idea of ethos, so a health campaign where the speaker is what's important to getting that persuasive message out there. 
Logos, if you recall, is the idea or proof or appeal based on logic. And we can find lots of campaign materials. This is a breast cancer example again, and I pulled this one as an example of using logic. And it's telling me really quantitative data. One in 20 women, one in eight women, uh, you know, should I do this? At what age should I be? You know, it's getting really specific. And, and logical appeals are important, and some people make decisions on logical appeals, but they tend to be pretty text heavy and not so exciting. So sometimes it matters who's speaking, and sometimes it matters what's being said. But oftentimes, communication campaigns, and even ones dealing with serious issues like things like breast cancer, are really using emotional appeals pathos. So the pink ribbon and funny t-shirts, these are examples of emotional appeals about promoting breast health. So ethos, logos, and pathos are very important concepts, and they've been around a long time since the ancient Greeks and Romans, and Socrates, and Plato, and Aristotle, and all those guys. And they're good basic concepts that remain true today when we're talking about how to design good persuasive messages. Now, Maslow was an important psychologist of the 1900s, and Maslow des des described what he called the hierarchy of needs. And what Maslow says is that humans have a specific hierarchy of needs, and until one level is met, you can't progress up the pyramid to another level. And this kind of really intuitively makes sense. He says our first needs are our physiological needs, and those are followed by safety needs followed by belonging needs, esteem needs, and ultimately self-actualization. And if you think about it, if you were suddenly dropped in a city from a UFO with no clothes on, what would you do? The first thing you'd be worried about is how do I get clothing, how do I get shelter, how do I get food? And once you have shelter and clothing and food, what you'd want to know is that you're going to have those same things tomorrow night safety, that you're not going to, somebody's not going to get you or you're not going to lose, you know, meeting your physiological needs. And once you had, you know, a decent place to live and clothes, the next thing that you'd probably reach out for is friends and other people to be around. And then eventually feeling good about yourself. So intuitively, Maslow's hierarchy of needs makes a lot of sense. And this can be applied to persuasive messages designs. And advertisers and motivated communicators are very well aware of who they're communicating with and what their audience needs are. So let's look at some examples of credit cards. This is a credit card, emergency credit card for emergencies, studentcreditcards.com. 0%, no annual fee, learn more. And notice how the guy is standing under his card. His card is above him like something that protects him and an umbrella. Now, the communicators who designed this message for this credit card, where did they think their audience was on Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Okay, sort of down there in the lower half of safety needs. And everything about the ads and the communication with this particular credit card is appealing to safety needs. Emergency credit card for emergencies. And he gets to hold it up above his head to protect him. Well, do all people who use credit cards need to feel safety or do other credit card users need to feel other things? Let's see this next example. Here we've got Citibank, and it's you know, and it shows somebody who looks important and an exotic thing. And in here, instead of standing under his credit card, this person's getting to swipe their credit card right across the skyline because they're so important and wonderful. Now these are credit card ads too, but they're not appealing to safety needs. What kind of needs do you think they're appealing to? I say they're appealing to esteem needs because. In these examples, the credit card user is in total control and has lots of power over their environment, and they're important and they're big. So credit cards and Monroe's, I'm sorry, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So those Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a very effective tool in conceptualizing where audiences are and what kind of messages will be effective for them. Now, giving blood, think about this. Giving blood is a hard sell. How do you get people to give blood? Well, you could pay them. That's where you go down to the plasma center and get your book money this semester. But, you know, most of the time they don't have the resources to pay them. How am I going to get people to give blood? It kind of hurts. It's inconvenient. 
I might feel bad for the rest of the day. I never really see a direct benefit for whoever gets my blood, if anybody gets my blood. How, if I am the motivated communicator and my job is to recruit people to donate blood, how can I think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs to design good communication campaigns to give blood? Can I appeal to the physiological needs? Uh, you're going to die, your mom's going to die. I mean, you know, that's really not working. In these examples, there's one example where they're actually soliciting based on physiological need of people in the community. Uh, safety needs. Well, is there anything about giving blood that makes me feel more safe? Not really. Well, belongingness needs. Ah, look at the example in the upper right-hand corner. Blood is blind, share some. That's sort of getting to belongingness needs. But if you really want people to give blood, the, probably the best persuasive strategy is their esteem needs. And look how proud she is. I gave blood. And you know, if everybody gets blood, they get a t-shirt, they get a sticker, uh, and they sort of get pats on the back, and, and they're told you're a good person and you're being a contributor to our community by giving blood. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs can sometimes be applied when we have really challenging communication scenarios, such as how do you get people to give blood? Because it's, you know, just not a pleasant thing to do so and it takes time so how are you going to do it by appealing to the esteem needs of the person and making them feel better about their esteem needs so um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a nice tool to understand motivations of people and a nice tool for designing messages well you know, the very nature of people is still under debate. And I told you in Chapter 5, Part 1, that really the study of psychology and the study of communication is very new. And, uh, you know, a basic debate exists whether people are rational or irrational. So ethos, logos, and pathos, I sort of implied that maybe logos might not be the best uh, way to approach all problems. Well... A very interesting thing is happening in the last few years with the advent of a group of scholars who call themselves behavioral economists. Now, traditional economists tend to believe that people were very rational, that they made decisions based on very specific cost-benefit analysis in their brains. And, you know, they didn't really put much weight on pathos and ethos as a way to get things done. But in the new breed of behavioral economists, we've got some great people out there these days who are really studying how people think. And they're bringing up the idea that maybe people aren't rational. And one of the popular scholars in this area right now is a guy named Dan Ariely. And Dan wrote this book called Predictably Irrational. And it was a big hit. And what he says in that book is that people don't always act in rational ways. But their behavior is predictable and reasonable within context. And so he really started exploring that idea. So he followed that up with a book called The Upside of Irrationality. Because, you know, it's not always wrong to make decisions on uh, pathos and egos. If we made all of our decisions on logos, if everything we did in our lives were logic, we'd be like Dr. Spock in the old Star Trek episodes. There's a lot of things humans would not do. One, logic. Is there any logic to procreating, to having babies? Uh, they cost a lot of money and emotional stress. And if they think they're going to take care of you when you're old, you might be mistaken. If we really got down to the economics of having children, it is not a very logical thing to do. But we all do it. Okay, or many, many people do it. What's this about? Well, it's dealing with our other types of needs, our emotional needs, you know, our self-fulfillment needs, our biological imperative to have babies. So are people rational or irrational? That's the question Dan Ariely asked. And uh, he's done quite a few things and, and written these books. And he did a TED Talk, and I want to take seven minutes and show you a clip from his TED Talk. Our intuition is really fooling us in a repeatable, predictable, consistent way. There's almost nothing we can do about it, aside from taking a ruler and starting to measure it. Here's another one. This is one of my favorite illusions. What do you see the color that the top arrow is pointing to? Brown, the brown thank you. The bottom one? Yellow. yellow. Turns out they're identical. Can anybody see them as identical? very very hard I can cover the rest of the cube up and if I cover the rest of the cube you can see that they're identical 
And if you don't believe me, you can get the slide later and do some arts and crafts and see that they're identical. <laughs> but again, it's the same story, that if we take the background away, the illusion comes back, right? There's no way for us not to see this illusion. I guess maybe if you're colorblind, I don't think you can see that. I want you to think about illusion as a metaphor. You know, vision is one of the best things we do. We have a huge part of our brain dedicated to vision, bigger than dedicated to anything else. We do more vision, more hours of the day than we do anything else. And we're evolutionarily designed to do vision. And if we have these predictable, repeatable mistakes in vision, in which we're so good at, what's the chance that we don't make even more mistakes in something we're not as good at? For example, financial decision making. Um, <laughs> Something we don't have an evolutionary reason to do, we don't have a specialized part of the brain, and we don't do that many hours of the day. And the, and the argument is that on those cases, it might be the issue that we actually make many more mistakes. And worse, not have an easy way to see them. Because in visual illusions, we could easily demonstrate the mistakes. In cognitive illusion, it's much, much harder to demonstrate to people the mistakes. So I want to show you some cognitive illusion, uh, or decision-making illusion in the same, in the same way. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite plots in social sciences. It's, it's from uh, a paper by Johnson and Goldstein. And it basically shows the percentage of people who indicate that they would be interested in giving their organs to donation. And these are different countries in Europe, and you basically see two types of countries. Countries on the right, that seems to be giving a lot, and countries on the left, that seems to be giving very little, or you know, much less. The question is why? Why do some countries give a lot and some countries give a little? When you ask people this question, they usually think that it has to be something about culture. Right? How much do you care about people? Giving your organs to somebody else is probably about how much you care about society, how linked you are, or maybe it is about religion. But if you look at this plot, you could see that countries that we think about as very similar actually exhibit very different behavior. For example, Sweden is all the way on the right, and Denmark, that we think is culturally very similar, is all the way on the left. Germany is on the left, and Austria is on the right. The Netherlands is on the left, and Belgium is on the right. And, and finally, depending on your particular version of uh, European similarity, you can think about the UK and France as either similar culturally or not. <coughs> but it turns out that uh, from organ donation, they're very different. By the way, the Netherlands is an interesting story. You see, the Netherlands is kind of the biggest of the small group. <laughs> um, turns out that they got to 28% after mailing every household in the country a letter begging people to join this organ donation program. Right, so you know the expression, begging only gets you so far? It's 28% in organ donation. <laughs> <coughs> But whatever the countries on the right are doing, they're doing a much better job than begging. So what are they doing? Turns out the secret has to do with the form at the DMV. And here's the story. The countries on the left have a form at the DMV that looks something like this. Check the box below if you want to participate in the organ donor program. And what happens? People don't check and they don't join. The countries on the right, the ones that give a lot, have a slightly different form. It says, check the box below if you don't want to participate. <laughs> Interestingly enough, when people get this, they again don't check, but now they join <laughs> the program. Now, think about what this means. You know, we, we wake up in the morning and we feel we make decisions. We wake up in the morning and we open the closet and we feel that we decide what to wear, and we open the refrigerator and we feel that we decide what to eat. And what this is actually saying is that much of these decisions are not residing within us. They're residing by the person who's designing that form. When you walk into the DMV, the person who designed the form will have a huge influence on what you'll end up doing. Now, it's also very hard to intuit these results. Think about it for yourself. How many of you believe that if you went to renew your license tomorrow and you went to the DMV and you would encounter one of these forms, that would actually change your own behavior? Very, very hard to think that it will influence us, right? We can say, oh, these funny Europeans, of course it would influence them. But when it comes to us, we have such a feeling that we're in the driver's seat. We have such a feeling that we're in control and we are making the decision that it's very hard to even accept the idea that we actually have an illusion of making a decision rather than actual decision. Now, you might say, you know, these are decisions we don't care about. In fact, by definition, these are decisions about something that will happen to us after we die. 
How could we care about something less than something that happens after we die? So a standard economist, somebody who believes in rationality, would say, you know what? The cost of lifting the pencil and marking a V is higher than the possible benefit of the decision. So that's why we get this effect. <laughs> but in fact, it's not because it's easy. It's not because it's trivial. It's not because we don't care. It's the opposite. It's because we care, it's difficult, and it's complex. And it's so complex that we don't know what to do. And because we have no idea what to do, we just pick whatever it was that was chosen for us. So that's interesting. So what he's saying about communication is that the architect of the context of communication may be more Im important than the message or the actual content of that message. So uh, if you want to be smart, read Dan Ariely's books and listen to TED Talks because you don't know, I mean, I think about these things as communication theory, but when we think about them, how they can affect us and our ability to make persuasive messages, these are very good and useful things. So, are people rational or irrational? Well, Dan Ariely says that maybe people systematically make cognitive errors the same way that we systematically make visual errors with visual illusions. And he's done really neat experiments over his career, many of which he talks about in his book and some of which I'm going to talk about now because I'm going to talk about priming and framing. And, and Dan Ariely does use priming in some of his experiments. Uh, and these ideas of priming and framing aren't just associated with behavioral economists. They're very big ideas among communication scholars at well, as well. So let's think about priming. Well, if you prime a wall before you paint it, you get it ready to receive paint. Well, in communication situations, we can also prime people mentally to receive a message or to behave in certain ways. And he did a cool experiment about priming and academic honesty. Now, we all know that we're supposed to be honest academically. Well, Dan Ariely did a really slick experiment where he set up situations where students could cheat, but he would know about it. And the way he set this experiment up was, he said, uh, he gave them a piece of paper and he said, solve this many math, solve as many math problems as you can in the next five minutes. So he gave them a piece of paper and the protocol was the participant would see the math questions and they would try to answer as many as they could in five minutes. And after their five minutes were up, they would take their piece of paper and go put it in a shredder. Then they would tell the experimenter, I completed five questions. I completed ten questions. And then they would get their reward and leave the experiment. Well, it was a little bit slick because the paper shredder didn't really shred the paper. It just shredded the half inch on either side. And in fact, he now had data on the pages, how many they actually finished and how many they actually said they finished. So he set up a way for people to be dishonest, but he would be able to measure their amount of dishonesty. So people are dishonest. He wrote a whole book. The Honest Truth About Dishonesty. This book just came out in summer of 2012, and it's a really cool book. So people do cheat and lie to themselves and others in different capacities and in different situations. So he was studying priming. So with no priming, just the experiment, people did cheat a little bit. Okay, But then sometimes he decided to prime them. And in one situation, he primed them. So before they started the math exercise, they were asked to recall as many of the Ten Commandments as they could recall. None of the Ten Commandments say don't cheat, right? They say don't kill each other and don't, you know, don't do things. Well, the mere act of recalling the Ten Commandments mentally primed people towards moral thought. And the group that was asked to recall the Ten Commandments cheated much less than the group who had no priming. He thought that was interesting, so I can set up situations to reduce cheating. He said, well, what if I primed people to cheat? And so what he did in that experimental situation was as the experiment was getting set up and people were getting their pages and instructions and stuff, he had his experimenter talk on his phone and his experimenter was kind of rude and ignored the people in the audience and, and the experimenter was setting up, you know, an appointment to meet his friends down at the bowling alley or something. And he just left all those people waiting there. And he had a personal conversation on his cell phone, you know, in a professional situation. It was kind of rude. Guess what happened? 
because the experimenter was perceived as rude, people cheated more. Okay, so priming is orienting people to process messages in certain ways or to behave in certain ways. And Ariely found that having students recall the Ten Commandments before an academic task reduced their cheating. However, he also found that if the person conducting the experiment was perceived as rude, participants would cheat more. So honesty, you know, the three groups of people weren't any different, but they cheated to different degrees. Some cheated less if they were oriented or primed towards moral thought, and some cheated more if they felt like they had been slighted or disrespected in some certain way. So that's an example of priming, and we use priming a lot in different communication situations as well. Another concept of how you present messages is the idea of framing. Now, framing says that media focus attention on certain events and then places them within a field of meaning. So let's explore that just a little bit more. Framing is how a problem is defined. It defines who the actors are and it implies the solution. It's a big difference whether you call somebody um, a guerrilla or a rebel or a freedom fighter. Okay, the, uh, they're the same words, they, I mean, different words, they might be referring to the same people, but whether they're called a rebel or a dissident or a freedom fighter totally changes the frame of the communication situation. And labels and words are very important to framing situations. For example, pro-life. Rhetorically, that phrase pro-life was brilliant. How can you disagree with pro-life? If I define myself as pro-life, how am I defining everybody who disagrees with that opinion? Pro-death? Nobody's going to call themselves pro-death. So the rhetorical response was pro-choice. Never had the power of pro-life because pro-life frames a situation in a particular way. Words like sexual harassment, that's a word that didn't exist before the 1970s. Did sexual harassment exist before the 1970s? Of course it did, but there was no word for it, okay? But that word definitely identifies a phenomena, and it also frames it as a negative thing. What about global warming versus climate change? To me, I think global warming is a scarier phrase. Climate change has been the phrase adopted by most media these days, and climate change is the, uh, the terminology that uh, many uh, um, contributors to uh, air pollution want you to choose. So climate change has been a, a choice word by industry, if you will. And the war on terror. Okay, that definitely says certain things. War on terror, we're calling it a war. And the United States had lots of wars, by the way. We've had wars on poverty. We've had wars on drugs. Okay, when you call something a war as opposed to a conflict or an incident, it definitely changes the priority of what that issue means to the American people. So let's look at a framing example of the war on drugs. We had a war on drugs, and back when Ronald Reagan was president, we had a big war on drugs, and at that time it was not uncommon for uh, American troops to be in the jungles in Colombia. We considered this an appropriate behavior for the Americans to be down there trying to squelch the cocaine trade. We had a war on drugs. Well, Reagan had a problem because can you win a war on drugs? No, no more than you can win a war on poverty or maybe even a war on terror. So he was rhetorically sort of up against the wall because he's running this war on drugs, and the truth of it is drug use in the United States was not going down. He needed a new rhetorical strategy. Well, his wife, Nancy Reagan, the first lady at the time, came up with the new rhetorical strategy, and in 1982 she said, just say no. You've been hearing just say no your whole lives probably, but they actually started somewhere, and it was motivated communication, and it was about framing, because the war on drugs is a totally different frame than just say no. So let's look at this. On framing, in just say no, who is the enemy? Well, on just say no, the user's the enemy. But if we're having a war on drugs, the supplier is the enemy. In the framing of the situation of just say no, who needs to take action? The user. 
The user just needs to take, take charge. However, if we're having a war on drugs, who needs to take action? Well, we would expect the military and the police to take action in a war, not, individual, not individuals. And if we frame the drug issue as just say no, who causes it? What causes it? Well, low self-control, because all you'd have to do is say no, right? Well, if we frame it as a war on drug, the cause has to do with criminals and bad people out there making it happen. And what is the proper response? Well, just say no. The proper response is health campaigns and individual action. The proper response on a war on drugs is the use of force to stop those sorts of behaviors. So just say no and the war on drugs is two different frames of the exact same issue. But how you frame it changes the actors, who's to blame, what are the proper responses to it. So framing is a very powerful communication tool. So framing tells us how a problem is defined, it defines the actors, it applies the solutions, and there are lots of examples of things from our society and labels and words that help us understand this concept of framing. It's how an idea is placed out there. Here's all examples of framing. Okay, in the upper right hand corner, I've got a picture that says no war, and the A is based on an oil rig. That is totally different than the left side of the screen which says support our troops. So it's very hard to disagree with support our troops. Okay. Uh, these other examples of framing, you know, worst president ever, or peace is the church's business, and the coexist bumper stickers. So we get, you know, we're all talking about the same issue here, but there's multiple different ways to frame and conceptualize and place that issue within meaning in our society. And that's why framing is an important communication concept. Let's talk about Freud versus Rogers. Okay, so people are rational or irrational. Well, Freud and Rogers had totally different ideas about the nature of humans. So there I've got Mr. Simpson, and on one shoulder he's got his little angel, and on the other shoulder he's got a little devil. Well, Freud was a very popular psychologist back in the 1920s. His ideas at the time about psychoanalysis were just revolutionary. But Freud, quite honestly, had a very dismal view of humans. And what Freud said is that all we do as humans is run around seeking unbridled gratification of our desires. Freud said if we didn't have social rules, all we would do is run around and have sex with each other and kill each other. He said we were hedonists. And he says, you know, the reason that art and society exist is to squelch those needs that we have that basically were kind of inherently bad, you know. Um, so that was, you know, what Freud said. That's what he believed. He, and then when he saw World War II and how people treated each other. In fact, you know, he just wasn't a very happy man about the nature of things. So he said, you know, if we do have cultural purposes, art, government, uh, that therefore we're expending our energy on those things and not on our sexual and violent desires. And he concluded that the price of civilization was misery, that we forfeited happiness and engaged in a sense of guilt so that we would behave well. Gosh, makes you scared of your neighbors, don't you? Well, Rogers is a different psychologist. He had a totally different view of how humans work. And Carl Rogers said, you know, that theory was just, just too dehumanizing. And he sort of pr promoted the humanist nature. And the central tenet of humanist psychology is that people have drives that lead them to engage in activities resulting in personal satisfaction and contribution to society, the actualizing tendency, the idea that we're good, that we want to grow, that we want to expand our our minds, okay, two totally different views of humans, and, and basically this is um, a, a distinction among psychologists that exist today. So you got economists that think we're rational, and behavioral economists, which says, oh, maybe not. Then you've got Freudian psychoanalyst thought, which says, you know, humans are driven by their sexual and violent desires, and then you got people like Rogers, he said, no, people are good. They want to aspire to good things. We get satisfaction out of it. A basic conflict in psychology. Okay, so let's go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Recalling that hierarchy of needs? Is Maslow more like Freud or Rogers? 
Yay. Maslow is a humanist. He's more like Rogers. He says, once our physical needs are met, then we can aspire to our esteem needs and our self-actualization principles. So uh, Maslow was a humanist, not a Freudian psychologist. Okay. Okay, how do you get people to do stuff? Well, there's three ways, three Ps, and this is it. You can get anybody to do almost anything using one or multiple parts of the three Ps. And the three Ps are power, patronage, and persuasion. So that first thing there, how do you get people to do what you want them to do? Power, you make them do it. You use police, you give them fines, you tell them they're not going to make their grade. Another way to get people to do stuff is you pay them. Patronage. You give them stuff they want. Perks, benefits, trades, whatever, so that they'll engage in the behavior that you want them to engage in. And then finally is persuasion, is that you get people to do stuff because you talk them into it, if you will. So let's use the example again of giving blood, okay? I could force people to give blood. Yeah, there's some places where, where you are forced to give blood if you go to the hospital, and, and not in the United States, but in some places. Um, I could take you to jail or fine you if you don't give blood every three months. I can basically mandate it and force you. Another way is pay you, like they do down at the plasma center. You go there and they give you money, okay, to use your blood. And then the third way is persuasion, okay? I can talk you into giving blood and find some sort of psychological satisfaction you get out of adopting the recommended behavior. So, of the three ways, what's most ethical? Forcing people to do it, paying them to do it, or asking them to do it and using communication as a tool to drive human behavior. Well, if you ask the question that way, it seems that persuasion, in fact, is probably the most ethical way to drive human behavior. Even if you are a motivated communicator, persuasion is the most ethical way to get people to do stuff. I'm going to give you a nice tool that will sort of pull together some of these ideas about motivations and perceptions. And this tool is called Monroe's Motivated Sequence. Now, Monroe was a communication scholar at Purdue, and he developed this motivated sequence. And what it is is an organizational style. You've learned how to do organizational styles, writing essays. And really, this is just a problem solution. It's a problem solution sequential organizational style and it's got a couple other steps in there. And what it is designed to do is to pull a recipient through the psychological process to get them to accept a persuasive message. And here's how it works. Monroe says, first, you need to get your audience's attention. Second, you need to establish need. And this would be the problem. You've got to explain to them what's wrong, that there's something wrong. And once you give them the problem, then you follow it with the solution, satisfaction. This is the idea of, what you're proposing will fix that need. Then he said, let's throw in a step there called visualization. And visualization is when you get an audience member to actually mentally participate with you as to what things would be like if they adopt your proposition, or maybe negatively, what things would be like if they don't adopt your proposition. And finally, a call for action. And a call for action is when you ask people to do specific a specific behavior. Now, people who make commercials are very good at knowing Monroe's motivated sequence. So imagine if you're an axe commercial, okay? It gets your attention, you know, the guy gets on the elevator and he smells his underarm and then a girl gets on the elevator and she's like, ew, yuck. And then they show you the product, axe deodorant. And then they show you visualization again where he gets on the elevator and he smells all good. And now that he adopts the proposition of using said product, the girl jumps in his arms and is in love with him. And then at the end of the commercial, if it's not said overtly, it's implied, go buy this deodorant. That's a 30-second commercial that actually uses Monroe's motivated sequence. Let's look at some examples. This one's pretty funny.
Zazoo condoms. Fun, sexy, safe. So in that example, they definitely get our attention because the little kid throwing a fit's hilarious. Okay, we see the need, okay, and definitely action. At the very end, it did an overt call to action, and it said, use condoms. Here's another example of a commercial that uses some elements of Monroe's motivated sequence to different degrees. So in that example, they did a fabulous good job of getting attention because you just wouldn't expect a cowboy on a horse on a New York City street. And then they shock you with the need, with the message. Uh, and there, in this case, they're trying to overcome a pre-existing notion that you're going to die. But then the idea of living with a, a long-term health effect from smoking, and they're like getting it out there. And then... We definitely have visualization and empathy there when we're seeing the faces of other people in the in the crowd. And there's a tiny little logos appeal in there. Do you see it? That little placard that said 8.5 million Americans will have, you know, uh, negative health effects from smoking each year. That was just a tiny little part of that whole commercial was logos. And then the call to action. Did it have a call to action? Did it present a solution? Well, it said infect truth, and it's directing you towards the truth campaign. But we see certain elements of Monroe's motivated sequence in that example. And now that you know what this is, I hope maybe you'll use it sometimes, maybe when you're trying to persuade your roommate to uh, go home this weekend. Or maybe you will start noticing it more often when you view commercials and other forms of persuasive communication. Because the motivated communicators out there, they're, they're sophisticated. They understand ethos, logos, and pathos, and they understand Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And they understand the architecture of decision-making to get you to adopt or to reject any certain particular idea. So Monroe's Motivated Sequence is a wonderful tool that you should be able to take and use. Okay. Internal review. So far, we've only done that first thing on our list, psychology, theory, motivations, and perceptions. Ethos, logos, pathos, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, whether people are rational or irrational, whether people are, are bad or good, and Monroe's motivated sequence as a tool. So why do we have these basic, you know, very basic debates about the natures of humans? Well, let's remember, and this came up in part one, that social science is not very old. Social scientific study of psychology and communication is really only around 100 years. The first academic journal in psychology happened way in the late 1800s, and the first wave of really scientific study of communication on a systematic scale didn't happen in the United States until the 1940s. So, like we learned last time, uh, theory doesn't always have to be accurate, and theory development must be ongoing. But because communication is difficult, theory gives us some good tools and ways to conceptualize problems and issues and to understand better the way humans behave. Let's move on now to the concept of public opinion. We hear a lot about public opinion. If you pay attention to the news, they're telling you what women in Colorado think about Mitt Romney versus what women in Colorado think about Obama. We hear lots of measurement of opinion, and people who measure and understand opinion, you know, hold high, high ranks in, in political campaigns and other things. But, you know, what is public opinion? Well, Wikipedia defines it as the aggregate of individual attitudes or beliefs held by an adult population. 
And the study of public opinion can be broken into four big categories. Sometimes we just study the measurement of public opinion and public opinion distribution. So basically we're just trying to describe what people out there are thinking. But then sometimes we want to investigate the internal relationships among individual opinions that make up public opinion on an issue. So we want to un get in there and tease out about different ideas people have and how that brings them to a conclusion. Or we may describe or analyze the public role of public opinion because there are people who study, for example, public opinion and then public policy. And they ask, does public opinion actually impact public policy? Uh, and then sometimes the study of communication media and how messages are disseminated and how propagandists and motivated communicators actually impact public opinion over time using mass media. So there's lots of people out there studying it and, and studying it from different approaches. And there's lots of people out there measuring and want, trying to understand public opinion. There's the American Association for Public Opinion Research. There is the Roper Center. And the Roper Center has lots of archives of public opinion research. Lots of people like you know, if you're watching the news, they'll just do a quickie 1-800, everybody call in, everybody email in, online surveys. We're always asking what people think. In fact, it seems really important to us what our neighbors think. But one of the true pioneers in the measurement of public opinion was Gallup. Okay, and George Gallup, and he's, you've heard of Gallup polls, and in a minute I'm going to show you Gallup.com. He was the person who really started for the first time systematically measuring public opinion. And the first time he did it, he did it because he was motivated to help his mother-in-law in a political campaign. Well, Gallup started the Gallup Organization, which just absolutely specializes in measuring public opinion. And if you go to Gallup.com, you can find all sorts of wonderful information there. Uh, so on any given day, they're going to have stories about what their most recent poll has found. And amazingly, Gallup uh, Dot com gives away tons of information. You can go there and hunt trends A to Z and hunt up people's opinions on all sorts of other all sorts of things and they give it to you in beautiful understandable graphs. They also measure public opinion worldwide in different places. Um, and so there's lots of information there for us to use free. Also though, they make money doing consulting and in certain specific questions on their national polls for people who will pay Gallup to gather information and to analyze information for them. So as you and I can go there and get lots of stuff free, if you wanted to, Gallup would be a company that you could outsource to to collect data for you, certainly on a national and now international scale. So I went Trends A to Z and I looked up the War on Terra and uh, what I found here was that they asked, how satisfied are you with the way things are going for the U.S. in the war on terrorism? Are you very satisfied or not satisfied? And the dark green indicates those who are satisfied, and the light green indicates those who are not. And back in 2003, when we were at a different stage of that conflict, people were very satisfied. But since between 2006 and 2008, though, what we see okay, is, is pretty parallel lines. Okay? So that's the kind of data they collect and they do it on all sorts of things. Okay? Another one is the Roper Center and I went to the Roper Center and I looked up well what what did their public opinion say about the war on terror and what I got was their opinion on the war on Iraq. And they said considering everything do you think the United States did the right thing going to war with Iraq or do you think it was a mistake? And in 2003, only one quarter of the population thought it was a mistake. But four years later, in 2007, more than half of the Americans thought it was a mistake. So there's all sorts of really interesting information out there that people who measure public opinion uh, are willing to share with us. There are also very specific public relations agencies that you can hire. So if I really wanted to know what Kansans thought about the vegetable department at Dillon's, I could hire a research firm to go and, and collect opinions on that. So opinion poll data about museums. Yes, I can go there. So in the Roper archives, I found a Pew survey about museums and what they did they asked had you been to a museum in the last year and it turns out less than a quarter of the population had been to a museum in the last year 
I went to Gallup and I looked up their information about museums and it was somewhat older. But what they said was fewer than four teens said they had ever visited an art museum in 1976. And that that number actually went down throughout the 80s. Okay, And in 2000, it went back up a little bit. About half of them had been there. But I, you know, continued doing my research and I did, you know, a Google News research. And I came up with this story. It's a little more recent. It's from 2009. And what they found out is that people are going to museums because it's cheap, kind of free entertainment. Now, why would I even care about people going to museums? Oh, good. We're going to get to our case study about the Campus Art Museum. Well, on our campus, down there in the southeast corner, we have the Beach Museum of Art. And the Beach Museum of Art approached the Public Relations Campaigns class one year. They said, we want more students to come visit the museum. In fact, that's their mission. Their mission is to bring Kansas art to the people of Kansas, and they want students coming to the museum to learn something and to expand their cultural horizons. So the communication challenge, the thing we wanted to persuade students to do, was go to the museum. Well, the other P's, I could pay them. Right, they don't have a budget for that, and, and that doesn't seem quite right. Or power, I could get a bunch of professors to force you to go to the museum. Oh, persuasion. They asked us, please design communication campaign so that we can motivate and persuade more students to come in and visit the museum, to physically come in the building and visit the museum. So that was our challenge as the communication campaigns class. And that's the senior capstone course in the public relations sequence. And students are put into agencies, and each agency is supposed to go through the public relations process of research, right? Start with research, and then move on and plan, communicate, and evaluate. So different agencies did different things, but, you know, so... We cared about that data, public opinion data, about museums because that sort of gives us some information about what's going on specifically at Kansas State. But what's happening nationally may not be what's happening in Manhattan. So each of the agencies in public relations campaigns did research. And most agencies just went out and asked the same old questions. And, and they did quantitative research and they asked students, have you heard of the museum? Do you know where it is? Do you read the Collegian? Do you pay attention to flyers? And you know, basically what they found out was that, yeah, people knew about the museum. They saw it down there and, and uh, yeah, they look at flyers. And some people even knew about different events and traveling exhibits at the museum. And no, they didn't go to the museum unless their teacher made them. Okay, well, this isn't really, you know, illuminating information. This isn't really research that's going to work real good to help inform designing a nice campaign. But one agency, they did something smart. They didn't ask oh, regular questions about where do I publicize and have you ever heard of it. They asked a different question, and they said, why won't people go to the museum? Ah. So that's, that's something you can't really put on a survey. So they decided to do focus groups. And they did focus groups where they'd get 10 or 12 people together. And this is an interesting way of doing research because opinion polls measure people's opinions in isolation. And what people think and say by themselves may be very different than what people think and say in groups. So that's one of our issues with public opinion because it can change or it can change whether you're at work or whether you're at home. So they decided to do focus groups and they just talked with people and let themes emerge about why wouldn't you go to the museum. And what they found out was really a key finding. They found out that at that time, students didn't go to the museum because they didn't realize they were invited. They didn't feel welcome there. And in fact, if you walk up to the museum, you have to walk around the doors and walk around the corner and go up the stairs with the big chandelier, and it may seem like a little intimidated. And even though they advertised and said they wanted students there, truth of it is, students didn't feel like they were really invited. And with that insight, with that understanding of the opinion that was the barrier to getting people to go to museums, this particular agency came up with a great communication response. And they said, they changed, they designed a campaign, and the core tagline of their campaign was going to be, get inside, Beach Art Museum, get inside. And as a tagline, get inside, that was kind of really smart because 
it is what we call that call to action. Use condoms. Get inside. It was very specifically telling people what you wanted them to do. Get inside. And they also used some communication theory. They used two-step flow theory. Instead of in their design of their campaign, instead of saying, oh, let's run some ads and put up some papers, they said, let's use two-step flow theory. Let's use important opinion leaders to get people to come to the Beach Art Museum. And then they focused in on resident hall assistants because the resident hall assistant tends to be a very important person, especially to new people to Manhattan, and, and they live in the dorms. The uh, RA may be a person you talk to and take advice from quite a lot. And so they really focused their campaign on resident assistants. And resident assistants were invited to the museum for an event where there was food. And resident assistants were given free stuff to put up on their bulletin boards that advertised the Beach Art Museum. And so the whole campaign was theoretically driven. Okay, They did research to understand and discover the opinion barrier. They designed a message to respond to that opinion barrier, and they designed a communication protocol based on two-step flow theory. So your communication is not easy. People know the museum's there. They just didn't know that, that somebody wanted them in the museum. So communication is difficult. And that's an example of how one agency thoughtfully approached the problem conducted research, understood opinion, designed a thoughtful campaign message, and then delivered that campaign message in such a way to heighten how people responded. So I hope that as a case study sort of pulls together all the many, many ideas we've talked about in this chapter dealing with theory and public opinion. Now we're ready to summarize. Chapter 5. In Part 1, we did the big myth, the communication models, and a history of communication theory, as well as talk a lot about the nature of theory itself. And what we know is that psychology theory and communication theory is a baby, approximately only 100 years old. There's still major debates out there about the very nature of what it is to be human. So we got lots of theory development to go. But we also know that theories can be useful to us, even if they are only partially understood. We know that we need multiple theories to explain some phenomena, and that's okay. So we've looked at some psychology theory, particularly things associated with what motivates people and what affects people's perceptions. We've looked at the concept of public opinion and how it's measured and how it's used. And finally, we used a case study from our own Beach Museum of Art at Kansas State University to hopefully pull some of these ideas together. Well, that's it, and I'll see you back next time for the video lecture associated with Chapter 6.